Because I'm convinced the whole world just wants to be Jewish. Everyone started wearing masks just before Purim. They started panic buying just before Pesach. And then everyone started counting days and weeks in quarantine and refraining from taking a haircut just before the Omen. Then in July, I leave my house and everyone's standing in line to buy new clothes and have their hair cut just before the three weeks. The three weeks, of course, that very sad period when we're not allowed to have our hair cut, buy new clothes or hold weddings. So basically, like the rest of 2020. Welcome to the virtual tour, Vayihi Bimei Achashverosh, in the days of Achashverosh, a virtual tour to Persia and the Persian Empire. I'm Nachli al Selavan from Jerusalem of museumtours.co.il, and I'm really excited to be presenting to you in honor of Purim for World Mizrahi. The Persian Empire, as told to us in the Megillah, spreaded Mehodu Vad Kush. Vayihi Bimei Achashverosh, Hu Achashverosh, Hamolech Mehodu Vad Kush, Sheva Ve'esrimu Me'a Medina. So to start this virtual tour, I would like to actually show you the breadth of the Persian Empire on the map. This map in Google Earth shows you more or less the farthest extent of the Persian Empire at its height, from the Indus Valley, which you can see in green on the right of the screen to the east, all the way to southern Egypt in the west, and to even to uh, parts of Greece. This is the Persian Empire, which included 127 various different provinces, from India to either Kush or Ethiopia. It's a matter of how you understand Kush, but Nubia is Sudan today. So you are looking at a very, very massive empire. And today in this virtual tour, we're going to be doing is we're going to be visiting the two capitals of the Persian Empire, along with a few other cities, as well as the material culture, the archaeology from those excavations that are found in museums in different parts around the world. So I'd like to get started with talking about Mehodu Vad Kush. I would like to begin this tour by talking about the breadth of the Persian Empire, Sheva Ve'esrimu Me'a Medina, 127 provinces. And I want to show that to you from the eyes of the Persians themselves. And in order to do that, I would like to take us to a special museum. We are going to the National Museum of Iran, which is in Tehran. Let's go straight there. We are now flying over to Tehran, looking at the National Museum of Iran, the historical museum for archaeological works, and there's a few other museums next door to it we can also visit. And I highly recommend traveling here on Google Earth. And you're going to get used to me using Google Earth and Google Street View. So let's enter the museum. The statue of Darius, exactly where we want to be standing. We are looking at the statue of Darius, which was actually found by accident in the excavations in Shushan, in Susa, but it was originally made in Egypt and eventually brought back to Shushan because of revolts and difficulties that were happening in Egypt. Now, before we should look at the statue, I want you to see in the very same map that we were looking at, but in the museum in Tehran, showing you the extent of the Persian Empire. And this is a map which we're going to be looking at again later on in this virtual tour. So you're going to see it again, and you can always pause and look at it more in depth. I would like to take a look around the museum to show you just a few really, really cool things. And we're going to see these artifacts in their original location. So it's going to make a lot more sense later. There's a few different moving parts to this tour. Let's start with the throne room. So we have our story with Achashverosh sitting in his throne room. I want you to show what it looks like when you're going up the stairs to go in to see, to see the king. This pretty much simulates in a very, very nice way. Stand and behold. You are looking at stairs, looking probably going up to a throne with an inscription behind. The inscriptions in the Persian Empire are found all over the palaces. They usually say that the palace was built by Daryavesh, by Darius, and then the building was completed by his son Xerxes, Herhersh, which we're going to take for granted that that is Achashverosh. And there is imagery of power on all sides. Let's look from left to right. On the left, we have the image of the king holding on to a lion, strangling a lion with a sword in his hand. And on the right, we have an image which is taken directly from the Assyrian iconography, from the Assyrian palaces. And it, it's a symbol of power of some sort of divine figure which combines a bull and wings and a human being. 
And on the stairs are images of attendants who are tribute bearers climbing up the stairs in pairs. I guess that's just how they symmetrically fit. See there? And this is something we're going to see a lot of. Okay, we're going to see a lot of this kind of decoration of attendants. Moving along the museum, you're going to see that there's a pillar here behind that statue of a dog, which is also from one of the palaces of the Persian kings. And that pillar, that capital, which was the top of a pillar, which has bulls, was intended to support the beams of the ceiling of some of the massive palaces in Shushan and in Persepolis. So we're going to get to all of that a little bit later, and we can, of course, spend a lot of time looking at all these tablets which were found in the foundation of palaces, describing who built them and how many people from different kingdoms were involved in building them, and the materials that were brought from all these exotic countries. That's all part of the propaganda of trying to show the Persian Empire as vast, cosmopolitan, and very, very rich, as indeed it was. Now let's go to what I'm going to call in this museum the crown jewel. And the reason I'm doing that is because of the imagery on it. The statue of Darius the Great. Let's look at the statue. So this statue, as noted, was found in Shushan. To the left of the statue are images of the reconstruction of Shushan, as well as from the actual excavation when you see the statue found unearthed and to the left is a glazed brick wall with an image of a median guard perhaps one of those immortal guards of the king and this is found in the palace in Shushan so if you want to imagine what the guards Bigtan and Teresh looked like this would probably be a pretty good guess but let's take a look at the statue so the statue looks like a typical Egyptian royal statue with the image of a figure of power like a pharaoh striding with his left foot forward and his hand uh, either outstretched or holding something like, like the crook and the flail or symbols of power. His head is missing, so we don't know what the head looked like. We can only guess. But the shoes are very clearly Persian kinds of shoes. And the base of the statue is very important because the base of the statue shows you images of all of the various provinces which were under the feet, literally, of Daryavesh of the Persian Empire. And I'm going to show this to you on the, on the, in a way that puts them all on the map, as you can see here on this plaque below Daryavesh. So let's take a closer look at this. Okay, here's a reconstruction of the palace. We're going to take a, a look at that later, but that's the main, main background for all of the slides, so you'll see it a lot. So in Egyptian iconography, the name of the king is actually written inside this enclosed circle or loop, which is called a cartouche, which is just French for cartridge, cartouche. This is, by the way, the key to unraveling the mystery of reading hieroglyphics, which we know from the Rosetta Stone, which was analyzed by Champollion. And the key to unlocking it was recognizing that the hieroglyphics contained within a cartouche are the names of a king. And once you figure that out, you see what king is written in the ancient Greek, which we did know how to read. And to start comparing and to break it down, that's putting a very long story short, but I'm gonna mention the Rosetta Stone later because it actually does have some significance to the Megillah. Now, these cartouches are, of course, borrowed because it's no longer names of kings. It's names of different kingdoms, different provinces, which are underneath the feet of the Persian Empire, who called himself the King of Kings, Malche HaMelachim, Melech HaMelachim. And therefore, in Shabbat, we say, Mi Melech Malche HaMelachim HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because God is the king above the kings of kings, which is the way in Mesopotamia they referred to emperors, the king of kings. Cool. So this is showing you all of the various nations with a sort of description of what they look like. It has to do with their, their shape, their beard, what they're wearing, their hats. It's all very nice. And look at the various different names. And what you're seeing now is an image of all of these various provinces laid out on their location on the map. That is what you're looking at. You're looking at Ma Esrim Vesheva Medinot. You're looking at 127 provinces, which were all ruled by the Persian Empire. Now, our story takes place in Shushan Habira. Our story takes place by Ami Mahem Keshevet Hamelech Achashverosh Al Kisei Malchuto Asher Beshushan Habira. Achashverosh is sitting on his throne, and sitting on his throne is going to be important to us. We're going to see that in the British Museum very soon. But it's in Shushan Habira. Welcome to Shushan Habira. 
shush. If you read Arabic, you see it says shush. If you're looking at the English, it says shush. And what I'm showing you now is the outline of the royal palace in Shushan Habira, which was built by Daryavish, whose statue we just looked at, and completed by his son, Khirchish Achashverosh. Now, this palace is one of two capitals of the Persian Empire, because the Persian Empire operated between Shushan and Persepolis, or Parsa. So we are going to visit both to appreciate the magnitude of the Persian Empire and their architecture, and how that is relevant to our story. But first, I want to point out to you, that there are two different places in the Megillah, which are called Shushan, which we usually don't pay attention to unless we look very, very carefully. Or if you read the English translation, which tips us off, that Shushan Habira means Shushan the fortress. You are looking at the archaeological tell, which is elevated from the platform, from the rest of Shushan, the city, Ha'ir Shushan. You're looking at what's called Shushan Habira. So you're looking at the palace, and we're going to be visiting it on Google Earth. So hold on to your seatbelts. We are now at Shushan. Let's move around. Now there are two fortresses here. Don't be confused by the modern fortress which was built by the French expedition when they excavated here over 100 years ago. How could you possibly excavate an archaeological site without having a French-style European palace? So obviously they built a palace. But I want to show you the outline of the palace and that's the fascinating thing. So... The outline of the palace, the restoration of the floor plan, which is the best that we could do with what was found, shows us in elaborate detail all the various compartments of the palace down to the level of knowing where the different parts of the Megillah took place. So for example, all of these numbers show you the different parts of the palace and you can start looking at the Megillah side by side and seeing where the various parts of the story took place. So the Sha'al HaMelech, the gate, which is over here on the way to the fortress, was where Mordechai was sitting and where he overheard Bigtan and Teresh. And this is where the statue of Dalyavesh was found. Further in, you are looking at the Chatzer HaChitzona, Chatzar Bet HaMelech HaChitzona, the outer courtyard where Haman goes to talk about his plan for Mordechai, etc. And moving on, Further in is Chatzar Bet HaMelech HaPenimit, and then to the left of that is the throne room. The Apadana castle of Shush is very important for us because the Apadana is where the banquet took place. And when we hear that the, that the story took place for a long time, we saw images of what the Chel Paras Umadai looked like. We saw those soldiers in the museum. And Beharoto et Osher Kivod Malchuto et Yekartif Eret Gdulato, Yamim Rabim Shmonimum at Yom. This extravagant, luxurious party took place for 180 days. That is half a year. Think of the entertainment level that you need to have and the capacity to contain that many people for that long. Well, this is a very, very large palace banquet hall known as the Apadana or Apadana. There is also the gardens next to it, and we hear about Ginat Bitan HaMelech, which is where the party took place. I'm showing you some images of artistic reconstruction of the palace in Shushan, and also the palace in Persepolis. So you get the idea of what it looked like when there was a garden there. I'm going to take you now to the next administrative center or capital of the Persian Empire, which is known as Parsa, or as the Greeks called it, Persepolis, which means the Persian city, right here by the Zagros Mountains. Now, overlooking it from the top, you can see that it's similar in construction to the palace in Shushan. There is an Apadana here, which is almost identical. And there are several added buildings here that were built by the successive kings of Achashverosh. So this was an ongoing project. And there's a lot going on all around. You can see there's different parts of the royal compound. Now, I want to take you to a couple of places here. First of all, there's a place that you can see here that is called the Gate of All Nations. Think of Sheva Vesrimu Me'a Medina. Think of all the various different nations. We are at the stairs below the entrance to the palace. And I want you to see the stairs on both sides. And these walls, which look rather barren, but in some of them, you can see there's a little bit of relief on them. These walls were probably stripped because the reliefs on these walls are found in different parts of the museum. And we're soon going to see them in the British Museum. And we're going to see similar ones in other parts of the palace. But this showed you 
attendants and tribute bearers from throughout the empire climbing up the stairs to go and see the great Persian emperor. This was quite a sight to see back in the day. Let's move up to the top. We're continuing our look on the top of these stairs and look at all of these many different attendants and tribute bearers on their way up the stairs to go and see the Persian emperor. We're continuing our way up the stairs, but I want you to see the soldiers and the inscription that is missing from the center, but there's more inscriptions. We're going to see a few of them. The Gate of All Nations. And now look at the palace. Looking at it from afar, we are right at the entrance. Massive standing winged bulls and massive pillars. We saw the capitals of those pillars in the museum, and there's a lot of people who are moving into the museum. Just getting the overview. Look at how many visitors are coming to see the museum. We are now inside the palace compound, and I want you to look at the height of those pillars and just to try to imagine how high the ceiling was and how impressive it would have been to somebody in the ancient world and even today to come in and see this palace. These pillar bases also show you the power, the girth of the pillars that hold up this massive ceiling. We can spend a lot of time here, but, I, but the key is that I want you to just appreciate how much of this palace actually remains so we can get a glimpse of the mighty ancient Persian Empire. And here we are, we've just jumped to the other side of the palace just to get a view of some more of these fantastically elaborated walls and staircases and getting a view of different parts of the palace. It's really, really a massive palace. And I'm also showing you now a reconstruction by the artist of what it would have looked like with the garden. It's really, really a beautiful palace. And that's where the party took place, in the banquet hall and around the courtyard of the palace. Now it's time to talk about the actual party. And to talk about the party, where else to go but the British Museum, a great place for parties. The British Museum, as the British were involved in the excavation in Shushan and in Persepolis, have some wonderful artifacts which come from the museum. I want to show you exactly where they are in the museum in case you go there and you're looking right away to jump in and to find it. We are going to jump straight into the Persian exhibition. And you are looking at a replica from the city of Persepolis looking at King Xerxes. We mentioned Keshevet HaMelech HaChashverosh Al Kisei Malchuto. We are looking at the king sitting down on his throne with an attendant fanning him above the head. It was probably very hot that day. And he's holding a sharvit, a scepter, in his right hand. And how does that relate to our story? Well, consider this pasuk. Esther comes to approach the king, and the king extends his scepter, and she gets up and touches the scepter. And if you want to envision what that looked like, you can get an idea of how far away she must have stood if she's touching the edge of the scepter as he's holding it in front of her. So that is a fascinating way to bring the story of the Megillah to life. You're looking at an image of the king himself sitting on his throne, which is, by the way, seated on a much larger throne. It's part of the decoration on the entrance to the Persian galleries, and on the right and left, you're looking at images of the king battling lions, just like we saw by the throne room. Now let's go into the room. Now you're looking directly at the crown jewel of archaeology in the British Museum, perhaps only second to the Rosetta Stone. You are looking at the Cyrus Cylinder, which is very important to our story, and I do get into that in some of my other tours, but I'm not going into that today. Today we are going to be talking about the, the banquet in Shushan. Now, what we hear about the story is the incredible lavishness of the story. It's just a luxurious setting. There's a banquet and there is a mishte, there is a lot of drink and there's a lot of these kelim. I want to show you these kelim and the luxury up close. Silver bowls, there's also golden bowls. You're going to see some of them in the pictures here. And these silver bowls are accompanied by rytons, which are drinking cups, which have animal figures 
at their ends, they look very, very nice. And you can see that the Kelim Kelim Shonim is translated here as beakers of very design. Well, you are seeing a lot of very design. And there is a lot of gold and silver next to here. There's flatter bowls called fiali. And there's a lot of this jewelry made of gold. And what is said about the Persian Empire is that there was so much gold and silver that they never used the same dish twice. Imagine the luxury. There's just so much. Maybe the guests would get to keep them, take them home, right? Jewelry that was found. Some of this jewelry was found in the women's chambers in Bet Hanashim, which I showed you on the map of Shushan. We actually can map exactly where that area was based on inscriptions and what was found there. So you're looking at the luxury of the Persian Empire, which was really, really rich. And uh, needless to say, they spared no cost in impressing everybody with this amazing, amazing feast. This is the feast in Shushan. Now, who was invited to the feast? Chel Paras Umadai. Here's images of Chel Paras Umadai. We've seen some of these guys in the palace in Shushan. We've seen some of them in the palace in Persepolis. This is what decorated the palace. Below here is an inscription by Archashverosh. We may be able to talk about that a little bit later. I want to walk around here and show you the attendants, Chel Paras Umadai, as well as everybody who came from all of the different Medinot, Malchut Achashverosh, which is what decorated the gate of all nations. So let's take a look at just some of these characteristics. There seems to be the king leading them along to Shushan. There might be something symbolic there. There's Persians leading them, and here are people bringing in horses, leathers, maybe precious skins, precious materials. More attendants bringing special gifts of all sorts. You need to impress the emperor when you come to see him. Here's a Bactrian camel with the double hump. So the people are coming from Arabia. And moving on, we're going to jump to the other end of the hall. If this looks familiar, that's because you were paying attention. We were going up the gate of all nations and looking at the staircases in Persepolis. The lion attacking the bull is a very important motif in antiquity. If you want to think about that, it relates to the Midrashim about Yosef and Yehuda fighting each other. Yosef is the Shor and Yehuda is the Aryeh. That is something that we find time and again, and it's all over the ancient Near East. More attendants and tribute bearers surrounding an inscription, which is probably by Achashverosh or Daryavesh of the building of the palace, its dedication, who is involved in it. And so you're really getting a glimpse of the magnitude and the luxury of the Persian Empire. Now, a very important aspect of the Persian Empire has to do with how they communicated. And I'm going to take you here to this inscription by Achashverosh. And these inscriptions were often found in several different languages. And this, of course, has to do with the way the royal edicts were sent out to the Persian Empire. As we hear, Vayishlach sefarim el kol medinot amelech, el medina u medina kichtava, Remember I said we're going to get back to the Rosetta Stone? Well, here we are. We are now at Naqsharostam, which is a mountain. And there is an inscription here by the tomb of Darius I of Daryavesh, which is called the Behistun inscription. And this inscription is what the Rosetta Stone was for hieroglyphics, but to the Akkadian writing. The Akkadian writing, an ancient writing form, from Mesopotamia, and that writing system existed alongside the alphabet. It was different, and it was used in royal inscriptions from the times of the early, the early days of Babylon, and it goes on and on, more or less until the Persian period. And here we are going to look at a very important inscription, which is written in Akkadian. And let's move in to the tomb of Darius, of Daryavesh. Welcome to the Behistun inscription. You are looking at the royal tombs of four of the Persian emperors of the Achaemenid Persian Empire. You're looking at Achashverosh to the right, Darius in this to, next, and there's two other to the left. And what's important about these is their inscriptions. So let's look up close. There is an image here of Darius on his throne, and there's many people carrying him up, of course, of different nationalities. And inside here was the tomb, and there is an inscription carved on the wall. You can now see a close-up of what the inscription looks like. You see the King Darius standing, and in front of him are an image of Ahura Mazda, the deity of the Achaemenid Persian Empire, as well as many 
uh, captured people from other countries, and there's inscriptions car carved all around him. Now, these inscriptions, what's important about them is that they are written in three different languages, all of them in the Akkadian cuneiform script. Why is that important? Because once you have several languages, you can start deciphering the various languages. To make a very long story short, the Behistun inscription is to cuneiform what the Rosetta Stone is to hieroglyphics, and it's based on this they were able to analyze the Akkadian script and to learn Akkadian and ancient Persian, etc. How is this important to the Megillah? Because as we mentioned, the royal decrees were written in several languages, and what we are finding that is typical of the Persian Empire is that they write in several different languages. In this case, in three different languages. And I'm now showing you an alabaster jar. And I'm now showing you an alabaster jar, which is in the Metropolitan Museum of Art, which says on it, Xerxes the Great King, Achashverosh the Great King, in three different languages. You see three different lines of text in cuneiform. One of them is Akkadian, one of them is Ancient Persian, one is Elamite, and in hieroglyphics. Now, when we talk about Achashverosh HaMolech Mehodu Vad Kush, well, Egypt is within that boundary, and this is in hieroglyphics, and it was found in Egypt. So how about that? Isn't that incredible? And I do want to thank Rabbi Huda Landi for pointing this out to me when we were touring in the Met. And I also want to recommend his book, Purim in the Persian Empire, which is a source of inspiration if you want to learn about archaeology in the context of the Persian Empire. It's a great book. So that was just an example of how the Persian Empire is multilingual. And why is that important? Because when you have such a massive empire, you have to find the right way to work with people so that they don't rebel against you and so that they pay their taxes. And tax collection is the bread and butter of running an empire. And what makes an empire successful is how efficiently it manages to collect taxes and not to tax people to death, to keep them protected, to keep them relying on the empire and to make sure that they are loyal to you. So you have to have the stick and the carrot, but the Persian empire was very, very good with the carrot. And one of the ways they did that is being very multilingual. Now we have a couple more points that I wanna cover with you. We're back in the British Museum. We've talked about the Royal Banquet. We've talked about the Kelim Mikelim Shonim, the luxurious, dishes. We've spoken about the international cosmopolitan empire, which has imagery from all over the empire and images of them decorating. We've seen Chel Paras Umadai, and we've seen inscriptions. This is a trilingual inscription of Achashverosh, and we've seen other inscriptions. I want to talk to you about horses. Here's an example of a relief of Persian horses. It looks like there are three horses next to each other. And then there are these small little bronze toys of different animals. Some are horses, some are ibexes. Let's talk about horses. How many times do we hear about horses in the Megillah? Well, in several examples. The carriers went out right away on the double for the royal mission. And we have this showing up again and again. I mean, there is so much ado around the running around of horses with these royal decrees in the many different languages. In order to understand that and to appreciate that in, its, in context, I want to take you one more time to the National Museum in Tehran, to the map that I told you we're going to be looking at again. Look at this map. This map shows you in red the extent of the Persian Empire. And I want to point out to you that red line, which is extending from Susa all the way to Sardis in Turkey. The road from Susa to Sardis was the royal road of the Persian Empire. The Persians were able to create the fastest moving messenger system the world has ever seen. And I want to show it to you while I'm going to read the words of Herodotus. And Herodotus in the histories writes as follows, nothing mortal travels as fast as the Persian messengers. The entire plan is a Persian invention. And this is how it works. Along the whole line of road, there are riders stationed with horses in number equal to the number of days which the journey takes, allowing a man and horse to each day. Nothing stops these carriers from accomplishing at their best speed the distance which they have to go neither snow, rain, heat, nor darkness of night. The first rider delivers his dispatch to the second, and the second passes it to the third. And so it is borne from hand to hand along the whole line. Now, we are talking about a road which, which in traditional transportation at the time would have taken months. 
This took one week. The Persians indeed have Rukhvei HaRechesh HaAchashteranim Bnei HaRamachim. They had specialists which would travel along the empire and get all around the empire. And why is that important to us? Because in order to maintain control of such a large empire, you need communication. You need a way not only to collect taxes efficiently from the farthest extents of the empire, you need to be able to communicate with everybody there to realize what's going on and to send messages and to maintain decrees and order and to deal with things. So a messenger system was what enabled the Persian Empire to be the most powerful empire in the world at the time, only succeeded by Alexander the Great. And he was succeeded by the Romans and on and on it goes. So every empire sort of builds on the foundation of the previous one. Now that we've seen that, I want to talk about one last detail which has incredible significance which you may have not suspected. And that is, back in the British Museum, I wanted to show you a tiny little lion which is sitting around right next to the Kelim of the Mishte. This little lion over here is a weight. Now, the weights were decorated. They look nice because if you're going to have a very heavy weight of, let's say, I don't know, four, five, six, ten talents, you're not going to make something which is the big block. It needs to be movable, so there is a handle. And it looks like a line. It's kind of cool. And this is a standardized measurement. So one more time, we've spoken about tax collection. Now, the image that I'm showing you enlarged here is the same design, but it's a much bigger and heavier one. And it's in the Louvre. And this was found in Shushan. And it is a weight which weighs four talents, which is roughly 120 kilos, which means that a silver talent, a kikar kesef, is 30 kilos. Now, where is this important to us in the Megillah? Well, Haman comes to the king and he says to the king as follows. Let's destroy the Jews. I am going to pay the royal treasury, and we know where the royal treasury is in the palace in Shushan, 10,000 talents of silver. And if we know that a talent of silver is 30 kilos, we are talking about roughly 300 tons of silver. What a wild number. Now, according to Herodotus, this is roughly the annual tax collection of the entire Persian Empire. And then when you think about the king's reaction, it suddenly makes sense. Because what does the king say? Here's my ring. Sign whatever. What do you want me to sign? I'll sign it. You take care of my taxes. Do whatever you want. Now you understand the reaction here. It's incredible because how rich do you have to be to tell the emperor, listen, I'm going to take care of all of your taxes this year. All you got to do is give me a ring and let me take care of a pesky little problem in the empire. You're not going to hear anything about it. Just let me give me carte blanche. And so, ladies and gentlemen, what I wanted to show you here is that the concept of tax collecting is a backbone, the bread and butter of the empire. And Haman is now offering the king a solution. And if you look throughout the Megillah, you'll realize that the king is constantly having issues with collecting taxes. He's lowering the taxes. He keeps on lowering taxes. And how does the Megillah end? Wonderful. The king is finally being successful in collecting taxes from the Greek islands. So I'd like to sum this up. What we have seen now through this virtual tour of Shushan and the Persian Empire is several different aspects of the Persian Empire. We've seen that the material culture exists, that you can go to the actual sites and appreciate how the story unfolded, where it took place, and to appreciate the sophisticated empire, which had a massive palace, beautiful architecture, which borrows motifs and ideas from across the empire to purvey the idea of power in a way that many cultures will understand. We also found the luxury of the Persian Empire is seen through their abundance in gold and silver vessels, which they never used twice. We've seen jewelry. We've seen the imagery of the various soldiers and tribute bearers. We get an idea kind of what they look like. And we've also seen what it looks like for Achashverosh to sit on his throne holding the scepter, the Sharvit. But finally, we've seen that in order to run an empire, you need you need efficient communication and tax collection. And all of these different aspects of the sophisticated Persian Empire are all there woven throughout the story of the Megillah. And through this virtual tour, you're able to see how it all interconnects. And this is really what I love to do. I love to share this through the many different tours that I do. So I do hope to see you again on a virtual tour. You can check me out. My information is down below. There's a link that will take you straight to my site, museumtours.co.il. I hope to see you in another, another virtual tour, but I hope that what I've done is given you an opening to appreciate how through 
the geography and the archaeology and the history, we can really appreciate the story in Tanakh on a whole new level. That's all for now. I'm going to wish you Purim Sameach. Yeah.